Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hello, you're uh, watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest, and I am Teresa Griffin Kennedy. I'm also known by my married name, which is Teresa Kennedy Dupay. We have a wonderful show today. We have uh, an up and coming writer who's become very popular in only the last few months. Margaret Malone is with us today for the first half of, half of the show. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, I have your book here, People Like You. And that's it. It's a wonderful book of a collection of short stories, and it comes highly recommended by some very well-known writers. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some questions. Um, I just came up with 12, 15 questions, and we'll see how many we can go through. Okay. But um, basically, I just want to talk about the process of writing. I'm a writer, and mm -hmm. I'm always curious about what other writers think about, you know, um, what motivates them, how they, when they write, how they write. Um, what is it about writing that you find the most fulfilling? Um, do you enjoy the process of writing and revision? Um, yes. My favorite, it depends on what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing fiction, my favorite part of writing is revision. I love editing. Oh my God. I'm a little bit of I, a serial rewriter. I have I, a little bit of a rewriting problem. I, I love to revise. I love to revise. And sometimes you don't meet a lot of writers who say that. I really love to revise. I, I love can spend it. hours. That's I wonderful. love it. You kind of need to be, I think, if you're doing yeah. anything short form, especially. Yeah. And I, the book is short stories. And mm -hmm. that's really, I think, how the best short stories are born. Not always, yeah. but is just through the constant you know, hacking away and, uh, and making it just right. So. I, I like going over uh, a nonfiction piece, or I've just started writing fiction recently, which mm -hmm. has been really exciting, kind of liberating, because it's so free compared to nonfiction in certain respects. But I love going over things from, from the top to the bottom, like every day, you know, for three weeks. And, and it's that process of craft that um, it's just exciting and you you come to it with something new and fresh every time you you look at it yeah um, but I, I love that and I, I agree and I, I consider myself you know kind of a, a nerd because of that and I'm not the best writer in terms of grammar and the mechanics of writing I mean I have a really I think I have a good ear uh -huh. but um, but I love revision so it's nice to know that I love it too that it's you're my a... yeah <laughs> when I'm writing fiction when I'm writing memoir it's mm -hmm. the opposite my mm -hmm. favorite part is the first draft yeah yeah, yeah. Because revision in memoir is, I think, harder for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. I've written a couple things, but and I'm working on one, two that um, I still have to finish. But, <laughs> um, what is your favorite novel or memoir? Oh my goodness. Who golly. I know that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> who is your favorite male mm. author, and who is your favorite female author? Wow. I'm always curious. Oh my. <laughs> Goodness. Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to answer those definitively, okay. but, and I feel like my answers are a little bit boring, but um, what's coming to mind today are, um, I mean, so Raymond Carver is oh, one of my, yes. I mean, it's yes. such a cliche, but he really is. He He's wonderful. Fundamental yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and female, probably Amy Hempel. Is, who's a short story writer that not a ton of people know about I unless not, they're yeah. also writers. She's right. sort of like a writer's writer. Other mm -hmm. writers who write short stories especially know of her. Mm -hmm. But she is, especially, I'm interested in minimalism, and she is sure. the queen of brilliant right. minimalism short fiction. And that's what people have been saying about your short stories is that you um, you incorporate minimalism really well. And I, and I, and I, I definitely saw that reading them. Um, and I've learned a lot from this book. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot about writing because it's evident. It's, the writing is really tight and it's really crisp. Mm -hmm. And um, and I struggle with going on and on sometimes and I have to learn. You know, learning minimalism is, is important. Um, and But uh, yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes to depend on um, you know, your favorite writer. Or oh my gosh, it's so good. Oh, I'm, I'm supposed to come up with a book too. I can't think of anything right now. I'm going to come back to that when we keep talking. I'll blurt it out. Her, in the and middle her name of our is Amy Temple. Amy Hempel. Hempel. Okay. H-E-M-P-E-L. Okay. They recently put all of her stories, collector, all of her stories into mm -hmm. a collection a few years ago called just the collected stories of Amy Hempel. Cool. 
I'll look into that. Yeah, it's incredible. I have some favorite um, books. Um, probably one of my favorite novels um, is Suicide Blonde by Darcy Steinke. Uh-huh. I've heard of that, but I've never uh, read it. It's pretty uh, stark. Um, just such a... Uh, it's a wonderful novel, but it's hard to explain, but I've read it four times. It's like something I just go back to. It's, uh -huh. and it's one of my favorite novels. Um, it's definitely very, very dark. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, <laughs> I'm totally, I love the dark. So, oh, okay, I'll, I can think of one now. It's not a novel or a memoir. Mm -hmm. It's a book of short stories. Does that count? Yeah, yeah. So, Sam the Cat which is another book a lot of people have not heard of, but it's by an author wow. named Matthew Clam, who uh -huh. I think perhaps this was the only book. Mm -hmm. Certainly of short stories that he wrote. Sam the Cat. Uh -huh. I'll it's never from forget years that. ago. Um, <laughs> but it's absolutely insanely hilarious. Okay. It's All like right. dark and funny and true. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna weird Google that. I'm gonna Google and that it's today. <laughs> fantastic. I, I read two uh, books of short stories recently and they were written like a few years ago. One is called Black Tickets. Uh huh. I don't know that one. It's mm -hmm. and they're and they're really dark. They're like bo both well known for being collections of short stories by women uh -huh. that are really dark. Cool. The first one's called Black Tickets and the other one is called Bad Behavior. And that um familiar too. they're really good. Um mm -hmm. Just amazing story uh, books. I'll check those out. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, what is your favorite story from your book of short stories, People Like You, and why? Because hmm. I, I had a couple favorites, but I'd like to know what your favorites, favorite or favorites were. I have a were. few favorites. I mean, honestly, I really sort of love them all mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. Sure. Some of them I love because they're damaged. <laughs> Some of them I love because I wish I was them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, the one that comes to mind without really thinking is the a narrator in the story yes which is a story of a girl who's proposed to at the beginning of the story and mm -hmm. she's really young and mm -hmm. um i just i like her oh, yeah, because yeah. she's i, I, I wish that. i was her she just is yeah brave and i don't know interesting mm -hmm. and she seems fearless to me so my um my pa my favorite was the things we know nothing about mm -hmm. because of the issue of pregnancy and drinking and the way you handled that very touchy dynamic. Um, I, I like that story because I can kind of feel that you're kind of um, uh, how do I how how shall I put this? You're you're kind of um, exploring the issue of 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 drinking while you're pregnant and and you know there are so many people that would just automatically condemn that. You know, and here you are, you know, the character in the story goes and has a beer once a week, you know, and, and she's pregnant. So what? I mean, I, and I remember when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was like six months pregnant and we went out to dinner and I had, you know, I thought I'd order a glass of wine. So I had a glass of wine. I, I drank half of it and I felt so guilty. You know, I felt there's this ridiculous kind of judgment mm -hmm. that is placed on a woman who's pregnant. If, even if she has one sip or a half of a half a glass of wine during her entire pregnancy there's this this condemnation that she's somehow immoral you know and i, I and I, I i enjoyed the humor in that story yeah because there was some humor there is humor there has to be humor in that story it's actually kind of a, a dark story but mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I have two two lines of thinking about that. So one is, yes, totally agree with you. It's a huge, I think, particularly American cultural mm -hmm. thing. Because if you go to Europe, yes. it's really not a big yeah. deal over yeah. there. Pregnant women drink like a glass of wine. I'd say most nights it wouldn't mm -hmm. be that weird. But they're not like from what I've heard. Whiskey. No, they're not chugging <laughs> booze. But it's not. I feel like it's a little more our yeah. puritanical history yeah. in this country. I feel yeah. like it's a little more frowned upon here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and two is, I actually, my own experience, didn't really drink much when I, I didn't drink at all when I was pregnant, just because it took my husband and I a long time to get pregnant. So when mm -hmm. I finally was, I was absolutely <laughs> petrified to sure. even do, like, oh, anything. Gosh, sure. I was so paranoid. <laughs> so I didn't at all, mm -hmm. but um, I've had many women come up to me about that story who have said, thank you so much, it's so good yeah. that you wrote about that, because there's yeah. such a stigma, and I never talked about it, and yeah. I had wine, and it wasn't a big deal, and yeah. I've had a lot of women come out of the woodwork about that. Yeah, it was one of the more interesting, you know, it was, it was a story that resonated with me, yeah. um, definitely, um, and uh, I can remember, you know, I was 26 when I, um, my hus my second husband and I um, had my daughter, but I was 25 when I got pregnant, and I can remember you go through, um, even if you're younger and healthier and you got pregnant, you know, 25 
pretty young, but mm-hmm. um, I mean, I was I read about the that disease that you can get from inhaling cat litter or something. That, oh my god! That, and I yeah. flipped out and I'm I like know. crying and I'm calling the hospital and what if my baby's born with this birth defect? And I'm flipping out. I know. You know because you get so you know you become you so become afraid. afraid of everything. Yeah, it's really kind of <laughs> awful. Yeah. And that was actually before we went out and had dinner. It was at the at the Bread and Ink Cafe I where I had the infamous glass of half a glass of wine (laughs) but um but anyway that was funny that's a that's a wonderful story um uh, what story from this collection was the most challenging or problematic to write well that is easily the longest story in there which Mm -hmm. is almost kind of novella length called good company um which is a story of a girl and her boyfriends that go mm-hmm. to visit his parents in I Nevada. I liked it. I really liked it. Yeah. yeah. So that story lived on and off with me for years. Mm-hmm. And I would write, it just dogged me. Mm-hmm. I would write it and write it and rewrite it and live with it for months. Mm-hmm. And then I would put it away because I couldn't, I just felt like I couldn't crack it. Right. And then I would, I would bring it out of the drawer every couple of years and I would write it and write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And it just was like, just on and off. It was like like being in love with someone that you couldn't stand like and you you can't like you can't help it and you just like right. end up in bed with them every time you see them it was horrible I, oh, I really enjoyed God. that I enjoyed it because I was expecting kind of like the cliche the bitchy uh, mother-in-law you know and then it was nice oh you know she smiles at the girl and you know she likes her and it was like wow that's that's nice that it's a little more complex than just yeah. the stereotypical you know, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law type situation. Yeah. Um, At the end of the day, really that relationship between the narrator and the mother ends up being my favorite relationship of the book in a strange way. Mm -hmm. Um, I I love them, the two of them together. Yeah. Yeah. It was was good. Um, I also liked sure footing because I think it communicates a kind of emotional apathy Mm -hmm. that is common in the American landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, This feeling that you can either um, take it or leave it or take someone or leave them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I liked that story because, um, I I mean, it's, I I wouldn't say the protagonist is apathetic, but she's sympathy. You know, I I felt sympathy for her and yeah, I love her too. And I, I just, I, I loved thinking about that idea of, um, and which I think uh, is especially uh, more familiar with women in terms mm-hmm. of the way it's looked at, but just the whole thing of like being defined by a man and do you want to be with someone or do you not? And what does it mean if you choose to be in the way that I know mm-hmm. I have lots of friends that have felt when you're not with someone and you feel really good and that is always when someone like waltzes back in and you're like, right. no, no, <laughs> I'm so good right now. I don't need this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that doesn't really answer the question. And then so. there's so much um, stress placed on American women to, to be with a man that uh-huh. you have to be with a man to be fulfilled or right. to be complete. Right. You know, and that that's the narrative right there. I mean, I, yeah. I, after my second marriage didn't work out, I mean, we were still married for the 10 years that we were separated, but I was really, really happy for 10 years by myself. Yeah. And then I met Don <laughs> <laughs> and that changed. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I like that. I like that, um, that story a lot. What do you think is required in the creation of a successful and popular writer who connects with people? Successful and popular. <laughs> what? Um, I mean, without thinking the, first thing that comes to mind is just emotional honesty Mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't have to be true to you but Mm -hmm. I feel like it has to be true in the bigger scheme of Mm -hmm. the world and the way people feel Mm -hmm. because ultimately when you're when someone's reading something you're looking for connection and it's either you know some people read because they want to connect or some people read because they want to have you know like people that are into murder mysteries they want to have the connection is like, you know, the, the antithesis of that where mm-hmm. they want, they don't have any idea what that's like. Mm-hmm. Um, but either way you're drawing people in. And, mm-hmm. and so I, for me, it's emotional honesty is, yeah, that's the game right there. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I've always felt like, um, whenever I was writing anything, mainly, uh, creative nonfiction, but I, I've been experimenting the last couple months with fiction and having a lot of fun, but is to, to kind of embrace the, um, the aspect of, of truthfulness as you understand it mm-hmm. without worrying about, I, I never write like for an audience. I mean, I, 
I've taken so many writing classes and English classes and where that's stressed, you know, what would the audience think? Who cares? I mean, if you, if you approach it honestly uh, with a, an appreciation for truth in some way, it should resonate with, with the reading audience, but I, I've never considered. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think that can be a dangerous thing is to write if you're worrying about yeah. the reader. Because you're second guessing yourself and you're going to edit out good, good darlings and, you know. Yeah, it's also just a different <laughs> brain. I feel like the mm -hmm. writing brain is really different than the brain that thinks about yeah. that. And yeah. So I, I agree with that. I think I definitely agree with that. I started painting two years ago and I'm painting abstract and I love it. It, I don't know. I mean, I can almost feel like it's the different part of my brain. There's a certain part of your brain that is used when you're writing and it can be um, so exhausting, yes. especially after a, like a long stint um, of writing five or six hours of writing, you know, just continuously. I just feel just dizzy sometimes when I'm done. Yeah, I know um, I do too. <clears throat> if I go out into the world after I've been writing for a long time, yeah. I feel like I landed on another planet because yeah. it's a very, you create this own universe that you're, it's very strange. Yeah. I love that you paint. That's like, if I, yeah. And born again, that's what I'd like to do. I, you know, I, I thought about it for a long time. I, I when I was a teenager, I, I wanted to paint um, portraits. And I, for considering the fact that I was 16 and 17, you know, they weren't that bad, you know, for a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just didn't have the, uh, the time or the opportunity to pursue it. And um, about three or four years ago, I started thinking about abstract painting. I love abstract um, I just love it. I'm passionate about it. I can't, you know, figurative painting is a completely different skill set that mm -hmm. I don't have. Yeah. But um, I embrace everything about abstract. Um, and I've been doing it for a little over two years and having a lot of fun and um, learning a lot, too. Mm -hmm. But it definitely uses a different part of your brain. Yeah, no, it's cool. My kids are, <laughs> I have a two-year-old who's really into painting right now and she'll just like take the little water dish and dump it on mm -hmm. the and it makes the most beautiful sure. images and the sure. part of me is like don't dump that out but right. then it's like no no yeah you should definitely dump that out because right. that's gorgeous yeah the creativity the yeah gym. it's so yeah. immediate mm -hmm. with painting yeah love that yeah um <clears throat> what writing genres do you most enjoy and have you given much thought or attention to creative nonfiction? Um, it, for writing wise for mm -hmm. myself, yes, I also write creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Um, I've written several essays and I have a collection of essays mm -hmm. in the works. Um, and I've also written memoir. My husband and I have actually written a memoir together. Oh, neat. Yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> It's that seems like it could be a challenge. Challenging to write with someone. <laughs> You've done that, I guess. I find that challenging with your spouse in particular. It's, it's, it's that would be tough. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I love creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I write it. I read it. I had no. a real, um, you know, as I am sometimes want to do. I had like this real uh, bias against fiction. You know, what is it about fiction that's so wonderful? You know, why does everybody? You know, why do these people hero worship fiction writers? And I, I, I was like militantly, I'm a creative nonfiction writer, you know, and I'm starting to really see the um, allure and the, in, in the attraction to fiction writing and how much fun it is. I mean, it's, I had, yeah. I wrote this story and it's coming out in the Bicycle Review tomorrow and it's very oh sexually gosh, graphic, but oh my God, I had such fun writing it. It just wrote itself, you know, and I went over it probably 30 or 40 times because I'm, crazy like that but yeah. it was a totally different experience yeah fiction yeah. is I love I love it it's yeah it's it's magical yeah that kind of work yeah and I've been doing a lot of research and I've, it was just a lot of fun but it's um it's it's I I'm glad that I'm opening up my mind and I'm not so militantly against it yes I've met plenty of people <laughs> who if it's fiction they won't even touch it they yeah. just don't read fiction yeah because why bother right yeah and there, but there's so many things you can do. You can be so creative with fiction. You can do anything. And you can, you can, um, and of course now there's, you know, a recognized genre is autobiographical fiction, you uh -huh. know, which is probably what, um, a couple of my short stories are like that, but not the, not the big one <laughs> that's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great review and they've really come up. I mean, yeah. I think I, I sent them an essay like four years ago and it was a really small um, little website and now it's like mm -hmm. totally different and they have a press. And um, What do you think creates the consistent desire by readers for fiction as opposed to nonfiction? That's kind of the same type of question, maybe a little different. 
<clears throat> creates a consistent desire to read. Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, like um, fiction, um, because it seems like there's two camps. There's, you know, like we were saying, there's either the people who are militantly for creative nonfiction or the people who only want to read fiction, Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, and... Um, um, I mean, I, th I think it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I think some people read to uh, read about people who've been through something they've been through or mm -hmm. see life the way they see life. Mm -hmm. And I think also people read to have nothing to do with their own life. Either their life is hard like escape. or yeah. yeah, they read yeah. for escape. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so I think it depends or it's the same person reads for both reasons. I mean, I certainly, mm -hmm. I read for both, mm -hmm. depending on where I'm at. And yeah. the best books provide both, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. Connection and escape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when do you do your best work? When you're happy or miserable or somewhere in between? <laughs> um, and the, the reason I asked that yeah. is because when I... I felt like for a long time when I did my best creative nonfiction writing, it was when I was like really miserable and something really horrible happened and I felt really, you know, present emotionally. <laughs> I think for nonfiction, I unfortunately, my nonfiction is almost always really dark and it, I cannot get the funny out of my nonfiction. Really? It is really, I can do I can't wait funny to read, I can't fiction. wait to read your nonfiction. My nonfiction <laughs> is like, Oh, I can't heavy. wait. It's heavy. Oh, I love that. <laughs> um, I just can't, which is a shame because I feel like the collections of, of, of essays that do really well are the ones that bring the funny or can mix funny with, mm -hmm. you know, real or sad. And mm -hmm. I, I can do it in fiction and I cannot for the life of me figure out how to do it in nonfiction. I think because when I turn to nonfiction to write, it's usually because I'm deep in something Sure. Heavy that I need to explore, and the sure. way I explore is on the page. Right. So that's usually why I turn to mm -hmm. nonfiction. Fiction is way easier for me to write when I'm happy, or at least just content. Yeah. Not not in the throes of some kind of. Sure. Yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, it's just more fun too mm -hmm. than it can be fun. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on humor in fiction? Because there are some parts of this. I mean. There are like, I think there were three or four stories that I read. I mean, I just was like really laughing <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's kind of an ironic dry humor. Mm -hmm. It's like a self, uh, self-deprecating humor, Yes, yeah. you know, like a fed up, oh my God, what's next humor. And uh -huh. I love that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, there's part of me that feels like humor is necessary for me when mm -hmm. I, when I write <clears throat> fiction, mm -hmm. cause I just, uh, like exploring you know, s sadness or things that we have in mm -hmm. common that aren't always the happiest moments. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's, in real life, that stuff is always mixed with the absurdness of uh -huh. everyday life. Yeah. And that's my favorite stuff. And that, mm -hmm. to me, is what's funny about, mm -hmm. you know, that sometimes will pull me out of, you know, not a great moment is when mm -hmm. I see just some random hilarious thing on the street. I, I like so try and put that in my I like stories. People. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. those are the most, ins those are the, the greatest moments when you, when you walk by and you hear a snippet of conversation yeah. or, um, some, some, you know, I, I've had luck where I, I am downtown or something and, and a transient or a homeless person bursts out and says something really weird or profound. It just sticks with me. And yeah. I, I can remember a couple of years ago, I was downtown and there was a drunk man who'd probably been homeless for a few years mm -hmm. and we're walking by him and he just bellows out, the more evil you get, the more you enjoy it. And I'm just <laughs> like, oh my God. And I, I, I'm like, where's my purse? I got to get my notebook out and my pen to write, <laughs> write it, it down, down because, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I really liked people like you because um, the story, because it's, it's, it's so funny um, the way it, kind of navigates trying to um trying to please people mm -hmm. and keep up you know appearances and not really wanting to yeah and just <laughs> feeling um, like you're supposed to it's a, yeah. it's a funny story it yeah. really is it's a funny story Thanks. yeah people like you okay yeah it's okay um, but anyhow, yeah, it's it's a wonderful short story, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I noticed there's two short stories in here. There's two stories about um, with a man named Bert, 
Is, is Bert, yeah, is three Bert, actually. Okay, three. Bert and Cheryl, it's the same couple. <laughs> they occur three in three different stories. Oh, cool. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, I wondered do. about that. I wondered if Bert was significant or a composite Bert, character. He, he's just, Bert and Cheryl are characters that I pop up in my consciousness and I have mm -hmm. running stories going all the time in my head <laughs> about things that happened to Bert and Cheryl. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, this has to do with fiction, um, I wrote an essay about this, um, what are your thoughts on sex writing in literature? Because, I mean, I wrote this essay three or four years ago, and I was doing research, and I found all of these horrible articles, um, people were saying, you should never do it, you should never write anything sexually graphic in literature, um, there were certain ma male writers that were saying women can't write sex in literature, which I thought is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean it's it's because it's BS. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I um, yeah, I mean I don't even know how to answer that. It's mm -hmm. I, there's absolutely no problem with that. I, yeah, I was pretty. Um, in I think there's. I mean, there if it's natural to the story, there absolutely sh should be mm -hmm. sex in it if that's part of the nature of the story because that's the part of nature of it's part of life. Yeah. There's there's the bad sex award in England um, where they they f they find someone who's written a really bad section um, with sexually graphic content and some of them are really funny. I will say <laughs> um, in defense of, of not choosing not to write sex scenes, mm -hmm. it is really challenging right. to write a good it is. sex scene. It is. And the gr more graphic it is, right. I think the more challenging it is to do yeah. well on yeah. the page. It is, it's 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 it takes a it takes some it either takes like I know people that do it because they're just gifted at it mm -hmm. the way other people are gifted at you know you know crafting grammar whatever but um but I think it's it's I I um, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a necessary tool and ridiculous to think that you One, can't have good literature with sex in it. I, I agree, crazy. and I and I, I was I was offended mostly when I read some articles by male writers that said women can't write sex in literature. I was like, really? I I disagree because women know themselves. It's well ridiculous. I mean, yeah. historically, Simone de Beauvoir. There's Margaret Dura. There's right. women have oh, been Marguerite doing Dura, it forever, and men have yeah. been doing. It. I mean, Henry Miller wouldn't have a career if he didn't write about sex. Right. So right. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wrote an essay about that and of course submitted it and it went nowhere, but oh well. <laughs> um, what are some of the challenges writers face today? And by that I mean the well-known um, uh, recent thing, like in the last 10 years of writers just not getting paid for anything anymore and, oh, you're writing for exposure. You should be happy that we're going to put you on our website. We're not going to even give you a $10 Starbucks gift card, you know. I'm disturbed by the fact that writers are expected to spend hours working and writing and then just give it, give it away for free. It, it's, it's very, very frustrating for me. I sort of came up in the age of not being paid for writing. And so I have nothing to compare it to. Um, and it's just part of it. I mean, I would be writing anyway is the thing mm -hmm. and um it would be really great if i got paid for all the time that i spent working mm -hmm. but it just doesn't it doesn't happen anymore and the thing is i could choose to say well i'm not gonna give you my piece because you're not mm -hmm. paying me and they don't care because there's right. someone out there exactly. who is happily writing away who exactly. will that's what's and so frustrating so for me it's about i ha it's, it just has to be about the work it's always I, about the work i know so, uh that's uh, what I choose. One of my former professors at PSU, Paul Collins, he's an amazing writer. He's got a website. It's called um, The Literary Detective. He earns between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year just writing for like um, Tin House and Salon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he writes for Salon, but he writes for uh, Slate and all mm -hmm. of these other. I mean, he makes a lot of money because yeah. he's so well respected and he's so uh, well known. Um, another thing that frustrates me, of course, is that men are far more successful financially as writers than That's women. That's starting to change a little bit with thanks to Vita. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think the more exposure that problem gets, mm -hmm. the easier it is to solve. Yeah. Um, we also, um, I also want to ask, um, what is your next writing project? I have a couple going, so I'm already writing on another collection of short stories, mm -hmm. and I also have a collection of essays that's about two-thirds of the way done. Mm -hmm. I have this memoir with my husband, and then mm -hmm. I'm also um, working on a novel. Oh, cool. Yeah. So. Do, you have, do you have any plans for today? It is Valentine's Day. 
My plans for today are to go home and deal with my two-year-old and my four-year-old. Oh. And, um, yeah, that's, no, that's my plan. That's wonderful. Just to, my life is very regimented <laughs> with two little kids. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see. What are some of your thoughts on writing collaboration? You mentioned that you've, you've produced something with your husband. Um, I think writing collaboration is a great, if nothing else, a great mental exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, lo I, I loved it in many ways working with mm -hmm. my husband. I think it's a very, it's a completely different kind of writing. It was unfamiliar mm -hmm. and I, I think it, it created something I could never, I mean, I know there's no way I could have ever done it on my own. Okay. So I think collaboration is, if nothing cool. else, even if it's not published, just a okay. great exercise. Cool. I had fun with J.D. Chandler collaborating on the book that we did, uh -huh. and of course he's an established writer, so it was it was it was wonderful to have his direction because he's very confident and he's knowledgeable about the whole process. So I just did what he told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Research this, do that. Okay. <laughs> so. So uh, this is the sec This is the first half of the show, and we have a second half. We're going to have uh, Bruce Broussard is going to be interviewing J.D. Chandler and my husband Don Dupay. And I want to thank you, Margaret, for thank being here. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's been a lot of fun for to, me on. to interview you, and I hope that you will come on again um, when you have your next uh, collection of short stories Can't coming wait. out. Yeah, thank you. I will. Thank you. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard. I guess you, that first 30 minutes, again, it's, it was all about Valentine's Day, you know what I mean? And so naturally we have the, our, our own publisher, and Teresa DuPay, and, and she did an excellent job on, on that first half. I was really great. Thank you. Fantastic. And then Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. you and Happy Valentine's Day to everybody, right? And Don's here. Did you say Happy Valentine's Day to Happy Don? Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Did you, did you do breakfast this morning for her? I, no. What? Yeah, well, yes, I did. Okay, well, that's right. spaghetti. Okay, good, 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 <laughs> good, good, good. good. Okay, and then, so anyway, what we're going to do as a as a part and parcel of um, of publishers today, we got we got three writers here right in front of us. 
you've seen Don before. He's done a book aspect of it. And Teresa had been basically, she actually did the book. Oh, I'm sorry, no. She was part of the <laughs> I editing. was the editor. She was the editor of the book, okay. And she edited mine too, she edits the show. <laughs> and then we got JD with us today. Hi. And then so all of a sudden, uh, Teresa's gotten, she, uh, Teresa's gotten in, into her piece now. She basically is now, she put together a piece called Prohibition in Portland, Murder and Scandal. With with, uh, with with JD JD Channel or John right John yeah, yeah. good and then, and they had some samplings if you will of some of the other pieces that he's done it was his hidden uh, history of Portland Oregon right yep uh, you got this one right here murder and I mean uh, uh, just a variety of of, uh, of pieces from the Portland community so yes. to speak right right and and a lot of times you can just get those just basically just Google them somewhere yep. and then you can pick them up in different areas and whatever <laughs> but what we're going to do today is that uh, since uh, Teresa was part of this piece with you. It's kind of a first, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The first aspect of it. It was and a lot of fun yeah, co-authoring yeah. with Why don't you JD. share that a little bit? Don't you share um, that now, you know. JD asked me if I wanted to help with the publication of this book um, because I had found some information and and uh, it's called uh, <laughs> Murder and Scandal in Prohibition Portland, Sex, Vice, and Misdeeds in Mayor Baker's Reign. So I was very happy to be involved in it. Oh, fine. Fantastic. I mean, I, It's published at, through the History Press. The History Press? Out of South Carolina. Oh, cool, yeah. cool, cool. It's a very good company. Good. So why don't we just jump right into you, J.D.? Why, right. why, why this book? Well, this book kind of grew out of the others. Okay. Um, I've, been, I've been studying murder in Portland for about 20 years. Good. And I find murder to be a really interesting way to get into history uh, because it shows us things that people don't remember anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I wrote... Portland on the Take, uh, my last book that I wrote with J.B. Fisher, uh, we were looking at the organized crime and the police department in Portland in the 30s and 40s, and we ran across some information concerning the Torso murder case from 1946. And this is a case that, 70 years old, never been solved. Uh, in fact, they never even identified the victim. Uh, but while I was working on Portland on the Take, I came across a character that disappeared shortly before the torso murder uh, victim started to show up. And I just wondered, I realized that a lot of people wanted her dead and her, the timing of her disappearance was interesting. So I thought, I wonder if it's possible if she was the victim. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I asked Teresa to get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa, I, I uh, recognize that Teresa is a great researcher. Mm -hmm. And I thought it, I really could use some help in tracking this mm -hmm. person down and put Teresa on the case. And she came up with mm -hmm. a lot of great information. Um, so in the meantime, I had to had to do a lot of historical research to put it into its setting, and that's what we did. We put the torso case into into context with prohibition in Portland, and what the police were involved with there, and then uh, make the case for Anna, Anna Schrader as the victim for the torso case. Mm -hmm. So, without having physical evidence still mm -hmm. in existence, and you know, 70 years old, everybody involved yeah. in the case is dead now. Mm -hmm. We probably can never really solve it, but I think we're pretty close to a solution. Mm -hmm. here. Interesting, interesting. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting niche too. You know, what I mean, from a historical standpoint aspect of it, and and then people are more receptive to getting into it, and, and then this is something that's been there, and just a, now, now all of a sudden, you're using this niche yeah. to open up the doors from the standpoint of their particular area. Yeah, mm -hmm. from a historical, and that's, yeah. I think that's a yeah. real neat niche, and, and you've done several of these at this point in time, yeah. right? So you, so you're just co constantly just using that. Yeah, as a way of putting them on the shelf. Yeah, to give people. To, well, I, I've been doing my Slabtown Chronicle blog for um, twelve years now, mm -hmm. um, and that does historical murder. So I do murders from all periods in Portland history. And that's where the first book oh, in the no, series came out, uh, from Murder and Mayhem. Okay, um, another one right here. That was my first book from the History Press. And basically, I tell the history of the first hundred years history of Portland in murders. Hmm. Yeah. So each murder has a particular historical period or a, a particular historical point to make. Okay, and just go through JD, what's, what's interesting about this book is that JD was approached by the History Press and they asked him, would you like to, would you like to publish they a book want, with us? Yeah, they asked me for And that's book. every writer's dream, mm -hmm. to actually be approached by a publishing house and mm -hmm. say, hey, would you like to publish mm -hmm. a book with us? Because it doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And they like what I do, so mm -hmm. I just keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, and another point, when, I, when you start thinking about uh, our educational system, sometimes it's hard, if you will, to get the young people mm -hmm. 
to actually get into the history. Right. This is a good niche, and yeah. you'd be yeah. surprised of the kids actually yeah. reading yeah. across the board aspect. Yeah. Now, how, how, do you entertain the idea of, of getting these in the in the schools if you want? Well, actually, about hit, Portland history and hidden history of Portland. This is the one that's that it's not murder. We, we've already shown this one. Yeah, right? it's not murder related. Okay, all right. Um, but yeah. that one they use out at Madison High School okay, to teach a local history class. Again. Just one more time there. Okay. This actually, again. yeah. Um, actually, I have a great story about this one. Uh, this last year. They used it for the local history class at Madison High School, and the teacher asked me to come in and talk to the class. Really? So that I went in good. and spoke to the class, and mm -hmm. I, I talked about what a historian is and what historians oh, do. Oh, great. And uh, the kids really enjoyed my talk, and they asked me to take them on a field trip. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'll take you out to Lone Fir Cemetery. And we went and walked around Lone Fir Cemetery. There are a lot of very interesting people buried mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of them. Um, and so I showed them, and one of the graves that I showed them was the unmarked grave of Gus Waterford, who was Portland's first black firefighter. Really? Uh, he died in 1909, and for whatever reason, his gravestone either didn't have one or it disappeared, and they mm -hmm. sometimes do out there. Um, so I showed them where he was, and I challenged them to put a gravestone on his grave, and in June, yeah. we dedicated a new stone wow. for Gus Waterford's wow. grave. They, they did a fundraiser, and they got money together. Really? Quite a lot of money, and they got a, a, a tombstone. You know, Actually, stone. we... When there, it turned out that there were about a dozen firefighters out there that didn't have stones on their graves. Mm -hmm. And the fire department added Gus Waterford <laughs> to the ceremony, and we put a stone on his grave. And when you, and when you think about the times now, the, the struggle, if you will, with the divide of, of, of our uh, that we're living in at mm -hmm. a point in time, yeah. people are really needing that kind of this exactly. to, 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 to identify with inclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it really energized the kids. They Good. they. Yeah felt connected to the history yeah yeah, yeah which is very important yeah. and we're yeah. still trying to do that now exactly and i told them they even made a little history of their own <laughs> okay, right. okay. Yeah. well did they entertain the idea of maybe purchasing these and putting them in their in their library and uh i don't know if they're in the library out there i suspect that they are uh they're teaching the class uh, i think they're going to teach it again in spring quarter so mm. i'm looking forward to working with those hey kids parents there it is there it is you got it right here I mean, all you have to do just talk to your principal and let them know what's going on and I think that's a good the deal. books are, are, are historically important for a variety of reasons, but there's nothing in any of the books that's inappropriate for a teenager to oh, read. Good, there's nothing good, graphic. Good, good, um, okay. So, yeah. But even then, when you think about kids, that's what they want yeah. to hear. That's, yeah. what they yeah. want, that's what they want to read, you know, yeah. uh, because they're, they're doing it now on the whatever. Yeah. But, they, but the, uh, the idea of actually reading a book is mm -hmm. very important because, yeah. no, because during our time, it was always about comprehensive reading exactly right? because that's the only that's the way you really learn now we've got the smartphone you know we're taking that away but realistically you need to spend more time on that end of, yeah. at yeah. This end of the day. And, and these stories are, are written in such a way that they're really interesting yeah um, it's it's not dry the stories are, are just very engaging yes. and and no gory gory stuff no. and yeah. stuff falling out the pages and stuff yeah <laughs> some of it's a little gruesome but yeah but still but you know what I mean but it's, it's in a it's, it's in that format yeah. aspect of it that's yeah that. So, so how do you guys get together? I mean, how did you? Um, well, we met JD. We met JD through Facebook. Don, my husband, and I met JD through Facebook a couple oh, really? of years ago, and uh, yeah. Right on his book. Became, doing this stuff. That's how um, you got. Yeah, right about that time, um, and uh, we just became friends. Yeah, I did we, a little research yeah. on behind the badge. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we just have a lot in common as writers, you know, and we're interested in a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. so. We're all natural cold case detectives. <laughs> Well, that's fact, true. In fact, in fact, why, why don't we just ask the couple question? Did, did it, what, did, what did it do to you, Don? Well, they made me a cold case detective. Okay, it's okay, a lot of okay. fun to go over the old investigative reports right. and see how come they didn't figure out that this torso might be right. Anna Schrader. Yeah. Right, right, so it's right. fun to go yeah. back over. And you might have the opportunity to way to identify your your situation too. Yeah. The book that you wrote. What, yeah. what was it? What was that? What was the brand? And that yeah, was, it was called uh, Behind the Badge. Behind the Badge. City You've Portland, done this for the for, the for the benefit of those who yeah, haven't seen the it. Yet, whatever. And yeah. the other thing about Don's book is that the second edition is coming out in yeah. about a month. <coughs> oh, so really? the second edition will have additional photographs, one additional More story. Photos. It will have uh, author's blurbs in support of it, and uh, yeah, it's going to be really great. We're going to mm. send out press releases in about a month. Really, so, really, yeah, really. Now, edition. what what about uh, uh, let's see, uh, things that what, what do you what do you get the the, the material if you will mm. to put something like this yeah. together? Do you use yeah. the Oregon Historic Society? I, I yeah, yeah. we we'll use that. Use One the city them. city archives, mm -hmm. state archives. Where I start, though, is the Oregonian Historical Archive. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, Multnomah County Library has uh, the Oregonian digitized back to 1861, 
It's, you can access it online so it, and it's searchable so I can find just about anything that I'm looking for. Mm. Um, and the Oregonian, as long as you understand the bias of the Oregonian, mm -hmm. it's a really good source of information yeah. because they report on the <clears throat> every day. They tell you who got arrested, uh, mm -hmm. who got arrested for drunk driving, who, mm -hmm. you know, what happened at this address, mm -hmm. where there was a disturbance, what the police were doing, what the city government was doing. Mm -hmm. They don't tell the whole story, mm -hmm. but they give you the bare bones. Mm -hmm. And then you can fill that in with uh, documents from the archives mm -hmm. and, and those things. The archives, um, the city archives, uh, that's where I got a lot of information in the old police personnel yeah. files. Mm -hmm. um, the those, police records are incredible. Yeah, those are, I mean, that was just a gold mine and it was um, just happenstance that I found a couple mm -hmm. of letters that really confirmed that bootlegging was going on in the 20s and the 30s mm -hmm. um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. out of the Central Precinct headquarters building mm -hmm. on Oak Street. Mm -hmm. um, we can't, we, you know, we were able to prove that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but that was a really great source of information. For me. You know, another niche behind this whole piece again, too, uh, many kids are not going to the libraries and mm -hmm. using those resources that they are picking up in Oregonian. Mm -hmm. I can still remember, you know, back in my days, uh, that was part and parcel yeah. of the classroom. Mm -hmm. We'd have yeah. to read the newspaper and we just et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and I want to make sure that I throw that out to you because in all due respect, there are jobs there and mm -hmm. there, there, are, there are public service things mm -hmm. that are available to us, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of a yeah. stuff. Yeah. And and that's basically. And in fact, let me ask you that: How did you get involved in this stuff in terms of writing? What what, what got you so excited well, about writing? Well, a friend of mine got killed. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in 1992, up in Seattle, a friend of mine was a taxi driver who was shot to death in a robbery one night. And I, I've always, I've always had an interest in murder. You know, mm -hmm. I read uh, Helter Skelter and In Cold Blood when I was 11 or 12 years mm -hmm. old, and maybe I was bent. I don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks did during that time. I did exactly. <laughs> but I've always had that interest. But then when my friend James was killed, uh, it became very important to me to learn about what it, what it, this means. And uh, so I attended the trial of his killer. I got to know the family of the guy who killed him. I got to know a little more of James's family that I hadn't known. And I saw that murder has a serious effect on the people who survive it. Mm -hmm. um, and more and more, I start to see that almost everybody in a city is affected by this stuff. You know, um, one of the most common experiences of a city dweller is to know either someone who was killed or know of a murder somewhere close to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. So I, I got very interested in the survivors. And uh, so I always try to, to focus on the victims in my stories and mm -hmm. tell the story of who that was that got killed, because I think that's what's important in a murder. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that uh, the more I learned about murders in Portland, the more I learned about the city mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we live. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a, in a way, I, I've always thought that the history of how people die in mm -hmm. a city mm -hmm. can kind of make history come alive. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. ironic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's exactly where Don is. You know, I mean, that's, yeah. that's how I got sort of interest behind the badge. Yeah. Because we're constantly talking about the whole issue of police yeah. and this, that, and that. But there's another side. And as a result of that, yeah. we were able to really get in, got into what are the issues yeah. in that kind of work. And Don had the background, mm -hmm. and it really brought some very interesting things. Out, and it's a very timely thing yeah. at this point in time. What do you think, Don? Any I other? think that the river holds a lot of secrets. <laughs> Really? The yes. river. Uh, the, the, the side, yes. Beside ice boxes and things of that nature. You got anything else in there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the really, one of the great things about Don's book is that even though it is a period piece, yeah. Yeah. you know, he was a cop from 61 to 78, so many of the dynamics that are involved in police work mm -hmm. are timeless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So his book is as important today, um, even though he was a cop a long time oh, ago, yeah. it, these yeah. issues, these police issues that he discusses in his book are timeless issues mm -hmm. um, that will impact officers today. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just because he was an officer a while ago doesn't mean that, that, that yeah. his book is any less important than a police memoir that might be a little more current, like Ed Conlon's book, uh, Blue Blood, mm -hmm. that comes mm -hmm. to mind. Mm -hmm. But yeah, One of the things that's important to me about police history <clears throat> is that too many times when we're looking at the police, we think in an us versus them. Mm -hmm. We think policemen are all the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost yeah. it's a type of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, blue instead of yeah, black. Yeah, right. You know, you can look at black people right. as all one group. Right. You can look at white people as yeah. all one group. Right. You can look at cops as all one group. But that stops us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, where we can where we can start to move forward and do things the way we want to do them is when we look at the people that are involved. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do when I write about 
police officers. I try to write about the people that they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were a lot of corrupt cops that we write about in this book. And there were some cops that were accused of corruption who weren't necessarily mm -hmm. corrupt. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to tell what the truth is. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to get that across in this book. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I, I let Don spend a little time on that, the black and blue. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had a concern about the yeah. fact when, when he was there, it was kind of like old Portland. And, mm -hmm. and, and they, they were basically community type policing and things of that nature. And he had a concern about today they, they're dressed in black uniform. It is paramilitary. Mm -hmm. It is. But, yeah. Yeah, what was that? What was the point you were making well, about that, Don? They need to go back to the blue uniforms because there's too much of the I, they, we, they. Yeah. You know, military yeah. invader. You know, the colonial, mm -hmm. the colonial uh, model, as mm -hmm. they call it. So, uh, you need to soften the police back up. You mm -hmm. need to make them real. Mm -hmm. We're talking about recruiting. You know, and and uh, recruiting policemen here today. One of the things we need to do is send all the black policemen out mm -hmm. and uh, all of the gay policemen and all the short ones because the community needs to know we are they, they are us. Mm -hmm. We are tall, we are short, mm -hmm. we are black, we mm -hmm. are white, we are you. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, come and join us. Portland needs jobs. I mean, a lot of people in Portland need jobs and they need to recruit in the community. Mm -hmm. They don't need to go to California mm -hmm. to find some burned out guy they're trying yeah. to get rid of in mm -hmm. the first place. This is an issue that Don and I, I talked about yeah. um, a couple weeks ago, the issue of recruiting out of state. It could be very problematic because of um, the whole issue of getting, um, getting bad, bad uh, apples. Uh, people that are, a pro you know, cops that are a problem in one mm -hmm. department, you know, the solution is, is to transfer them. And so that's the real danger of recruiting out of state. We have enough talented, well-educated young people in the state of Oregon and in the city of Portland Absolutely. to get enough police officers recruited from here. We don't mm -hmm. need to recruit out of state. And I think the other thing is, I agree with Don also in the sense that we should go back to the blue uniforms. I think that if we, if Portland went back to the blue uniforms, it would na it would make the national news. Mm -hmm. It would set a standard. It would start a trend. Mm -hmm. Because what I've heard, I've talked to a couple of people, is that they decided to go with the black uniforms for financial reasons. It was cheaper. I don't buy that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't approve of it because it does present a visual uh, uh, that is very military. You know, we don't need yeah. to think of our police officers as soldiers or mm -hmm. uh, part of the military. I think it would be great if Portland went back to the blue uniforms, and I think if we did, it would make the national news in a positive way. Mm -hmm. You make a good point, too. When you, cause you hear this, this buzzword about community policing, mm -hmm. I mean, what better way to talk about community as opposed to just getting folks right here? Yeah. And what comes to mind with the Warrens, you know, you got, yeah. you got Bogle, you got uh, Jackson, you know, folks like that, because I can still remember Jackson. He's kind of a sh short guy, but he but he was very effective. He could drive powerful, with, but no, but he but he can drive his car by himself because he knew the people. Yeah, you know? yeah. And he knew the community. You know, yeah. and Don brought up a good point about the fact that during his days, you know, he 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 have a he had an area that he <laughs> basically patrol. But the bottom line is that he knew his folks exactly. And if they got yeah. a little drunk or whatever, he'd put them in the car and take them home, mm -hmm. drop them yeah. off, and you know, and, and that kind of thing. Now that is that's community policing. It is. You got me. Yeah. And we need more of that today. Unfortunately, yeah. we we got a book now, and and, uh, and I think the the qualification during Don's time was that you know it wasn't the degree type situation. Right. It was kind of deterrent, but that community policing part was there. Yeah. And it was kind of like a hands on. There was no heavy shootings and this, that, and the other. You hear because, in all due respect, you know, uh, you know, uh, when you think about it. That, um, we all we're all human. Yeah, folks are human today, and we've got the whole diversity thing, and as far as the department is concerned, and like I said, they, they, they've got women, you've got short people, long people, you've got all this. But the bottom line is that if all of a sudden you got to arrest a, a 200 pound guy, <laughs> and, you, and you and you're looking at five four, and, you, and the other right. person is seven feet, what do you do right. first? Yeah, right. there are some realities of the yeah, job. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, Don. <laughs> There I got that from Don. There are some realities. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that's something that I think that we need to bring back to the table. And, and in all due respect, we're pretty well dependent upon the old timers. Yeah. They know a lot of them just want to just retire and get out, and because they see the problem. But the fact of it is, a lot of times if you if you say the wrong thing now, it's about sexual harassment, is this and that. The, the bureau is facing a crisis right now because we have over a hundred officers who are going to retire, and oh. we're going to end up with a huge shortage. Yeah. One of the problems with Portland Police Bureau is. The standards are just incredibly stringent, and they want people with college degrees, and they want a clean slate, and they want someone who's fresh and doesn't have a history. They, you know, I mean, they will turn down people if they have a credit problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. they need to be a little more flexible. Yeah. Um, 
Well, that's the concern, you know, about the old times. You know, a lot of them just want, hey, I got to retire because I got to eat. You know, yeah. they still got to eat. Yeah. I mean, just not even being a cop, thats it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is just one profession if we're yeah. talking about. They're you know. recruiting virgins, and there aren't very many yeah. virgins yeah. that yeah. want to be policemen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They're more like the community, and you don't want them to be virgins no. either. Right. You want right. them yeah. to be, right. 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 you know, right. have a history of part of the community. As long as you're not an axe murderer, right. yeah. you know, if you were arrested for pot when you were a kid, so what? Yeah. 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 You know? So yeah. right, right, right. The, the thing they keep thinking saying about college degrees, college degrees are fine. I'm all for it, and I'm trying to get one of my own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't. You don't get a degree in common sense. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you don't have common sense, you can't be a policeman. Mm -hmm. right. That's the bottom line. It's a people-oriented business. It's communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's communicate just like just like your books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a exactly. communication piece, and people need to read them. Yeah. I agree. And this is a history that you can have a reference point aspect. I think it. everyone should read all of these books. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Very much so. No, I. Think it's a great deal myself. And post review. That's amazing. That's amazing. We got the superintendent. I'm, in fact, I'm going to be. I'll probably be getting the superintendent. She's got to come on and talk about where is the education here uh, in the Portland metropolitan area. And I'm going to ask her a question about uh, what's what's in the what's in the library. Well, hidden history of Portland is a good one for that because I tried to tell the stories of the people whose stories haven't mm -hmm. been told. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's chapters on African American history yeah. and women's history and a Asian American history, Native Americans, gay history. I want to make the history as inclusive as possible. Yeah. Okay. And that's another thing about about the current book. Um, there's um, a chapter. Chapter two is on the the girl rush um, of the teens, the early teens in Portland, and um, a, a lot huge, of huge huge migration of women to Portland. Yeah. The first real major wave of single women coming mm -hmm. to Portland mm -hmm. uh, between 1905 and about 1916, 1917. About 7,000 women a year. Oh wow! Wow, that's yeah. huge. How yeah. huge. Well, this this has been just great. I mean, this is just something that we need to follow up on. I mean, we're going to get the second edition here on this piece aspect of it, and we can follow up. And I would encourage, you know, in all due respect, uh, for you just to maybe tell your friends about this particular show, and you can pick it up on YouTube later on. And, and the bottom line is that we're going to really blast this thing out. It's very important. So thank you very much. Well, it's thank you. Thank great. you. Did a good job. Thanks. Did good. Don did a good job. It's all because of Don. You guys are going. Now all of a sudden we met Jay. <laughs> We're big time now. We're big time now. See okay. what Facebook will do. There you go. Right off, right off bat. Well, thank you very much, okay? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, folks, for being with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, next time around. And we'll surely have a pretty good show next time around. But now we got the elections coming on. I got a surprise for you this next time around. I won't say anything right now, right, T? Okay, Don? Okay. All right, J.D.? Okay. We're all together. <laughs> Folks, thank you very much for having, having us with you today, and we'll see you next week, okay? Take care. Talk to you soon. And please tune in again, okay? And read. Put it on the camera there, will you, will you Tom? You got us? Put us on the camera there. All right. I want you end off with it. There we go. All right, sounds great. We can keep talking.